Today we're going to talk about the integrated foot shift in your training methods. This is all part of the posterior chain series. I'm going to have nine parts to this. All the parts tied together, they can be integrated into your training to basically help with posterior chain uh, issues if you have them and or just get the right patterns for human movement because you'll see a lot of this integrates into human movement such as walking and running and this is part um, four the one I did prior to this was uh, the angular shank loading model and this can be done in all the angular shank positions and basically what the angular shank if you haven't seen it is a loading model based upon how wide your feet should be based upon the the strength phases that you're in and trying to prepare an athlete for this is, again most of this is not for um, bodybuilders power lifter athletes this is just for raw running athletes uh, field sport athletes etc so you can see what we do here is uh, I just want you to come to the realization that um, when you do your lifting a majority of time especially slow lifting and I'll get into that that you start with a on your left foot you would start with a seven o'clock position with force or a majority of your load and you shift it through the foot up into your big toe squeezing your big toe obviously and what you're doing with that foot roll and that foot shift during your lift is to address all the parts of the hamstring. When you feel this happen, happen in your foot, you will activate various parts of your hamstring, which then is obviously training them versus isolating them during the course of, of different exercises that you may use. Now, sometimes people will go up. You can go up on your toes. I'm not saying you have to. Some lifts will warrant that. Other lifts will not. This is your call and your program. I'm just telling you this is the concept an athlete should use when they're training. And um, we'll talk about this. This is during walking, what you saw here. Um, and that's where I'll mimic the walking um, the walking part of this in training. And we'll also address the sprinting. So going on to the next slide. So, like I said, this is the walking part, and what happens is the longer lifts, such as isometric lifts, eccentrics, above 80%, essentially loading zones 13 through 8. If you haven't looked up the tri-basic loading zones, I have loading zones for every phase of training, the amount of loads, the, the variation in the undulated model, or uh, the weekly uh, sequencing model used in the tri-basic tactical magazine or uh, book. And basically what you have is the first foot there at the top is the general lift. And then the fast lift, it would essentially shorten. Let's say you're in a power phase and a peaking phase um, with loading zones one through seven. I kind of misspelled peaking there. But what you have is a, you can shorten this phase because let's say in acceleration, you would be in that shortened phase too. Um, your whole foot wouldn't hit obviously in acceleration so be aware of that you don't have to force your athletes into that and if your athletes moving the lift a little faster they may self-adjust that which they actually should and there's two parts to this i'm going to just give you an example of how this would work um i do this especially in my glued hams reverse hypers that's what will be um that's what you would coach, but here's an example of doing it in reverse hyper. You can see that we start there, the foot shifts and rolls to the big toe. That's just a quick version. We didn't move the reverse hyper very much, but you can see, um, I'll go back to that. With that particular video, you can see how the athlete will push their foot from the outside. We'll start, uh, we'll start on the outside, and then it rolls essentially through the big toe like you would be when you're sprinting now this is again this is on a reverse hyper which is an excellent lift and here's the which we can talk about actually is the three-way foot method let me go back to this so this ties into the three-way foot position method that i'm going to speak about in future parts where you would do an external and an internal now this is this is uh, actually actually rotated way too far but this is just for demonstration purposes so this foot roll can be done in any position okay it can be done externally 
and internally rotated. And you'll find out how to address your athletes and what, how to administer that. I'll show you how to test them in the future parts of this. I believe it'll be in the next part, if not the following part. And this is part four, or this should be uh, part four, yes. So let's say you're on a glute ham or you're um, basically doing another lift where your feet are on the ground. This is how the foot would roll. Obviously, this is left foot. It's rolling through your big toe. Now, that's the force going through it. Your foot sometimes doesn't even have to move. You don't even have to lift your heel off the ground, but the force should come through that, and that's the way that it looks. So this is actually a good angle if you want to look from the back. Um, let's say you're looking up straight down at the ground. This is the plate of a glute ham hyper. And you can see your athlete will roll their foot through the full range of motion up on their toe on a revert on a glute ham hyper. So as you can see that that takes place, they're rolling with the integrated foot shift method into their big toe. And we will be talking about this a lot in our triphasic courses uh, coming soon. But ultimately, every lift, even if it's a closed or open chain, should have that integrated foot roll, and if you try it actually, you feel how you roll through your hamstrings and different hamstrings at the, uh, even in different lifts when you didn't think things would be um, working all the hamstrings, and you actually feel that that range of motion. Now, the integrated foot shift can be done extremely fast. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm gonna. This is this is on my YouTube page, but you can see this again on my YouTube page. This actual exercise, if you search the glute ham triphasic power five, phases five through uh, seven. But I'm going to go to the the big picture, the big phase here. Um, we'll see it, and you can see how fast this thing athlete is doing her glute ham, and you can barely see, but. She is rolling her foot. Uh, let me stop and pause that. When she goes, let me get rid of this. She will roll her foot quickly from the outside to inside. Now, I didn't start at 7 in the back of the heel. We started around 9 or 10 like I talked about prior. And you can see how fast and aggressively she does her, her, her um, glute ham hyper. Now, with this athlete, been training with me for years and not that you can't do this i mean i've had athletes that you can do this in a couple weeks this aggressively and come up this hard and fast if you go through an isometric eccentric phase basically a triphasic which strengthens the tissue and then this is what you want to get to because this is how fast things happen in sports at least the eccentric portion they actually happen a lot faster in the concentric portion but you can see how she's I mean, you can see how she's off the pad and going violently. Um, she's got a small band to help her. Not that she needs it. Um, this was in a peaking phase, so we sped it up. But she can do this without um, a band, too. And But, again, she's years in training. But not that you need years of training to be able to do this. Uh, usually in a couple, two to three months, most athletes should be able to do this if uh, you're stressing them enough. So, the next... Now, remember, in the speed phase, again, I just want to talk about it doesn't have to start at 7. It can go all the way. It can go from 9 to 1 very quickly. Even in faster phases, it may be a shorter stroke in the foot. But the integrated foot shift has to take place for athletes in many phases and many lifts. Now, there might be lifts that you say, can't do it. It's not going to affect. Just realize that that's not as a sport specific. Then you want to, and that's okay. There's times, triphasic is not sport-specific. I've mentioned that many times. It is training the tissues to perform sport-specific um, movements later. Uh, I'm not going to go on a rant, but many of these people who, who question triphasic, they talk about motor units. They have no idea what they're talking about. Motor units aren't part of the triphasic. There's, you're not doing lifting for motor units. You should know that if, you, if you're doing any isometric and eccentric. You're, you're actually training the tissue. Um, and then I've heard some people ask me, and, and however they're describing the motor unit aspect of this, they have it. Uh, some people have it backwards. Some scientists have it right. But I don't know why they would talk about motor units when you're training the first part of triphasic, the eccentric and isometrics, because that's not the purpose. I think they completely missed the point. But so with this, this is just a part, and you have to understand 
the next part of this from performance cycling to functional transfer complexes to the angular shake loading model, the integrated foot shift goes in everything here. Probably is not tied to the thoracic tuck method, but the point is, is that this goes into every aspect of training here in the posterior chain, and all these are integrated together. Okay, so this is part four of the integrated or the posterior chain series and the integrated foot shift, which is a, a, a key part of your training to uh, keep hamstring problems uh, at a minimum. And also, which I'll cover at the end, maybe a uh, final version of this or the uh, putting wrapping it all up will keep your athletes out of quad dominance, which is another problem with posterior hamstring problems.